Marco, thanks for joining us on yeah. 10 Percent True. Yeah, you're happy to be here. How's it going? It's good. Thanks. Good. Yeah, we're yeah. we're happy to have you as well. This is actually, believe it or not, the first recorded interview I've done this year. Um, my my yeah. other interviews went out in January. I'd recorded at the back end of last year, so it's my first interview. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, so thanks for coming yeah. on the channel. Um, you, you're a rare beast. You you are a fighter pilot <laughs> who went from flying the F-111 to flying the uh, light gray eagle, the F-15C. So I'm um, yeah. really really looking forward to exploring that transition with you. But um, as is the fashion, uh, can we start by talking about how you got into flying, what, what the uh, attraction was and what your first exposure to, to the world of aviation was? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, I, I started out as a, actually, I always say that I think I was born to be a pilot. I was, I was born at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. Uh, as my dad was at the time, uh, he was enlisted as a crew chief. And uh, so Mom used to say that I would cry until the jet, unless the jets were flying. So I, I had to hear the whine of the T-37 or the afterburners of the T-38s. Uh, and then uh, when they shut down at night, I'd stay up all night crying. Uh, so anyway, it was kind of funny. But uh, but my dad was uh, crew chief and, and always loved aviation. So when I was growing up, he got out after Vietnam. Uh, and then we moved to Southern California. But he would still he was still in the guard and he did uh, crew chiefing on uh, on a OA twos and so we would go down to the airport and he did some work with the Planes of Fame Museum in Chino uh, some of the old fighter jets down there in Chino California and so I used to just hang around the airport and uh, watch things with him so kind of one of my first memories as a little kid was that I wanted to be a pilot and I wanted to move to Colorado and I never I never really knew why. I thought I wanted to live in Colorado, uh, but ever since I could remember, I just wanted to be a pilot. Um, so as I was growing up, I just kept uh, that as a goal. And then uh, into high school, um, found out that if I went to the Air Force Academy, they guaranteed a pilot training slot. So I applied for the Air Force Academy and ended up going there. And uh, that offered me a ton of opportunities in aviation uh, that developed my interest uh, to really want to fly fighters. Did you have, um, so, so this, I don't want to try and pin you down on your age or anything, but uh, when, when would this have been? What, what sort of time scale were you at the zoo? Um, I got there in 1980 uh, or 84, graduated in 88. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was a great time. I mean, the, Reagan was the president. Uh, a lot was going on. The Air Force was building up. Uh, we didn't have any wars going on. So it was kind of a training Air Force. Uh, but the Air Force Academy gave us, tons of opportunities. So, I mean, I, I did two different trips while I was a cadet, uh, one to Kadena where I actually got uh, three F-15 rides, uh, in the back seat and, uh, also flew in the, uh, in a pave, Pavlo helicopter shooting the gun out the door, uh, on the range. And, and we went up in the AWACS and watched uh, them controlling the F-15s over, uh, out there over Kadena. And then we also did a, uh, air refueling trip, which doesn't sound like exciting, but it was an SR-71 uh, that was taken off out of uh, there out of Kadena. So I got some great pictures of the top of the airplane all wet and fuel streaming off the back of the SR-71 as a cadet. Uh, and then I also did one of our, I was the, what they call the cadet in charge of the CONUS field trip, which is for sophomores. So I took a bunch of brand new sophomores and we went to Holloman uh, so that would have been my before the summer before my senior year. And while I was there, I got two AT-38 rides. Um, and so, so those experiences, I mean, by the time I graduated, uh, and I, I kind of tell the story when I was at pilot training on day one, they always ask, I guess they always ask, but our operations officer was given the, the welcome to Willie brief. And he said, does who out there wants to be a fighter pilot? And I raised my hand and, you know, then he, he launches into, You'll be lucky if you even get your wings, douchebag. Uh, but I'm like, <laughs> well, you you asked. <laughs> yeah, I felt like I was the only dude who was honest. Uh, so uh, I knew there was a couple other guys who obviously felt the same way, but they were, you know, hands on their uh, under their legs, not not raising. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I I realized that you know when he said that it was probably a little bold, but uh, but hey, that that's what I wanted. I'd, I'd flown in the F-15 uh, three times and in the AT-38 twice, and I'm like, that's what I want to do. Uh, so, so one of the reasons I was asking about sort of when you were at the zoo, um, at the Air Force Academy, 
um, was, you know, to try and decipher what that sort of post-Vietnam Vietnam influence was like. I mean, I know Robin Olds went to the, um, the mm. Air Force Academy after he, he came back from Vietnam. Um, yeah. And I'm, guess, I'm guessing that in your um, UPT um, experience, there must have been ex sort of salty, crusty fighter pilots who'd come back from Vietnam. Yeah. And whether or not that sort of pervaded the atmosphere that you were in. I think it did to some extent. Actually, one of the guys that influenced me the most uh, there was an AOC, an air officer commanding a couple of squadrons over. But he was a Marine exchange and he was a Hornet driver. And uh, and I talked to him a lot. And I actually uh, was about two signatures away from taking my commission in the Marine Corps, uh, just kind of listening to stories about him flying Hornets and thinking, man, that would be so sweet. I want to fly Hornets. Um, and then he, he kind of sat me down at the last minute and said, uh, Hey, do you, do you want to be a rifleman? And I go, no, I want to be a fighter pilot. And he said, well, what happens if you get hurt in uh, Marine basic and you can't fly? I said, well, uh, it would suck pretty bad. And he said, why don't you, I think you, if you don't want to be a Marine, you probably need to stay on the track you're on. And, and so I, I kind of took that to heart and, and uh, stayed in the air force and, and uh, decided I'd, you know, do it a little bit harder, I guess, a little bit of a harder path. Uh, to get fighters because it was pretty hard to get a fighter uh, in the my time frame. There weren't there just wasn't that many assignments. Uh, the majority were uh, either FAPES or heavies. Unless you went to oh. Shepherd, I mean I'm sure you know about Shepherd. My my roommate at the academy actually ended up going to Injept, and uh, uh, I was jealous. But Willie was pretty good. Since I was born there, I figured it'd be a good place to go. So, so that's your NATO joint jet pilot training, and that, that is mm -hmm. a, a guaranteed fighter assignment at the end of that? It is, yeah. It, back then, it was guaranteed. You either washed out or you got a fighter. Um, over the years, it's changed a little bit where the, uh, the, the Air Force, <laughs> our Air Force has gotten a little bit kinder and gentler about uh, killing you and uh, taking you out of training. Uh, so now they'll, they'll let you finish up and, and go to a, a heavy if, if that happens. Uh, mostly a bomber. They'll send you, keep you in ACC and send you to a, a B-52 or a B-1 or something. But yeah, back in the 80s, if you washed out or you got a, or you got a fighter out of NJAP. And so that was, I mean, I don't really know much about it, but that was determined, your your attendance to ENJJPT or NJET, as you call it, was uh, mm -hmm. determined by academic schools. So this was, you know, were, yeah. were you a smart, a smart guy or later girl? So, somewhat. There, I mean, a bunch of the guys that ended up going from the Air Force Academy were glider pilots. They were uh, glider instructors at, at the Air Force Academy. There was a lot of aviation programs that you could actually uh, be part of as a cadet. And one of them was you could be a glider instructor. Uh, and so they got good recommendations because they had a lot of flying time, instructor time already. And so there was some kind of uh, thought process that they probably would succeed uh, so, uh, so they did well. And of course, academics was important, uh, for the rest of us who didn't get selected. Cause that was a board process that was earlier, uh, than regular selection. It was your combined military grade point average and, and, uh, academic grade point average put together into what they called a, um, uh, what the heck was it? I don't remember something, uh, combined grade point average. And then the, you ranked ordered one to my class had 700 of us who went to pilot training uh, so one to 700 and you we all showed up on the same day and you walked in and when your number was up you pulled from what was left uh and so my whole goal i actually did pretty well there i was in the about 100 ish and uh so i was like you know uh, my big thing was i i just want to go to willie that's where i was born it's closest to my house where my folks are uh and so i was you know blessed to end up going to williams uh but that, that was really my only, my only thought is I got to get to Williams. And of course, try to get as much leave as you can. When we graduated, we had 60 days of leave if you could get it. Uh, and so I was able to get the slot to Willie with like 56 days of leave, which was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Uh, just for the observant amongst uh, the viewers, we've changed rooms so that we can actually yeah. see you because uh, we were having some some uh, video quality issues. So now we can we can see. You. So thank you for doing that, Marco. Um, yeah, happy so, to do it. so back to UPT then. So you, um, how how did you find the experience? What, what were the, what were the challenges of that? Oh, uh, UPT was was great. I mean, I I, uh, I absolutely loved it. We uh, tweets tweets was was awesome. I had an instructor, uh, Captain Starbuck. He was actually my flight commander. And uh, a couple of funny stories about 
just his name because uh, at the time Battlestar Galactica was a big show and Captain Starbuck was uh, one of the stars of Battlestar Galactica. So uh, anyway, he was he was an old C-141 guy and basically uh, just cool as a cucumber, very, very quiet. And uh, so one, it was like on my third or fourth flight and we're headed out to the airspace and uh, the ox field at Willie was called uh, Headpen. And uh, we were passing 10,000 feet where you hook up your zero delay lanyard. And I said something like, hey, zero delay lanyard connected, how about you? And uh, he didn't say anything. So I elbowed him and I said, how about you? And he goes, head pen? Oh yeah, head pen, it's over there. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you fell asleep. It's like my fifth ride. Um, but uh, it gave me, I guess, a little bit of confidence that he wasn't too worried. Um, but yeah, I, I did really well in tweets. Um, I actually never busted a ride. And so we got to the end and uh, I actually didn't have enough hours to complete the program. I was done with all the flights, but I didn't have enough hours. Um, so I had to go, actually we did a, a low level out and back uh, just just for time. I needed another 1.4, 1.5 hours. Uh, so I flew two flights and finished up and then went down to the T-38s. Um, obviously back then everybody did the same. We all went through the 37 and the 38. Uh, and then the washout rates back then were higher. Uh, we had a few guys that didn't make it through tweets and then uh, a few more that didn't make it through 38s. Um, the T-38 was a little bit of a more of a challenge. Um, the biggest part, just uh, getting to be good at landing it. As I, I did bust a, a ride or two on uh, no flap, no flap landings. Uh, but once we got through that, I, I excelled at the formation stuff and uh, and uh, all the kind of more tactical aspects of it. And, and I, I loved the T-38. Ends up uh, over my career, that's the airplane I have the most hours in, uh, almost 1,000 hours in the T-38 with because of my AT-38 time. You went to uh, leading fighter training after that. Mm -hmm. did, you know, yeah. did you know at that point what your operational assignment was going to be? Yeah, at, at Willie, uh, so the Simon Knights actually was a pretty good story. We had our class, we built a kind of a vending machine, looked like a vending machine. And it, so it had uh, four windows and it said like uh, TAC, SAC, I guess it was TAC, SAC, MAC or ATC. And then there was two other lights. One said, try again. And one said, uh, uh, sit down. Uh, and so I, I, I think um, you might know Boz Beals. Boz, Boz was in my class. Uh, and so Boz was ahead of me because we went uh, alphabetically. And uh, so he obviously got an F-15. So, so his, they messed with him, of course. And when he pulled, he figured he was going to get a fighter. So he pulled a tack and, and it said, sit down. <laughs> and they kept bringing him back up and telling him to sit down. And, and finally, you know, he got his F-15. And so we, I was sitting there going, well, there it is. That's the, you know, the fighter for the class we're probably done. Uh, and then I, I came up and, and I had been told by everybody in, the, uh, in my tweet side, because I'd done so well in tweets that, that I was designated as a FAPE. I was coming back as a tweet FAPE. Uh, and so I kind of expected that actually on assignment night. So uh, when I went up to the to the dream machine, I pulled ATC, just figured I'd make it easy. Uh, and it said, try again. And I went, hmm? So, so I pulled ATC again, thinking they were just messing with me. And it said, try again. Uh, so I kind of sheepishly lifted my hand up and pulled on TAC and of course uh, the 111 came up. Uh, and so I knew I was going to the F-111 at Mountain Home at the time. Uh, and at the time, it was a PCS because it was uh, the B course uh, was more than six months long. Uh, so I knew I wouldn't be staying there, but I didn't know where I would go uh, after Mountain Home. Uh, but I was headed to Mountain Home in the, uh, in the F-111. We ended up getting one more F-15 in my class later. Uh, Mike Stapleton, I don't know if you know who's uh, Mike Stapleton. A great, great individual uh, died of cancer a couple of years ago. So nickel for him. What did you know? I mean, what did you know about the F-111? What did you, and what did you think about it when you knew you were going to go and fly it? Yeah, I actually was uh, really stoked. Um, my uh, academy class, we were, uh, our sister squadron was an FB-111 squadron up at Pease Air Force Base in Plattsburgh, New York. And so I'd done two trips to Plattsburgh uh, and gotten to fly the F-111 simulator as a cadet and kind of crawl around the airplane. And so I thought it was pretty cool. And actually uh, in pilot training, you fill out your dream sheet 
Um, so during pilot training and during my, uh, actually this kind of is a little bit of a story from back at, uh, when I was at Kadena, when I was a cadet, um, I did, uh, as I mentioned, three F-15 backseat rides. One of them was an ACM ride with a, with a guy who was kind of young, a lieutenant. I was in the front seat and I actually saw the guy rolling in on us twice and I'm like, Hey, there's somebody over there. And that's about all I knew. Uh, you know, and then, Hey, it's break left. And, and so, uh, that kind of experience. And then I really liked flying low level in pilot training. So I kind of went, well, two seats seems like a good idea for just even if all they do is look around. Uh, and I like to fly low level. So my, my first top three choices were the strike Eagle, which, uh, at the time you couldn't get out of pilot training, but they said, if you don't put it, you know, some class is going to get one. Uh, if you don't put it, you're guaranteed not to. So I said the uh, F-15E, the F-4, and my third choice was the F-111, and then the F-15C. And again, just kind of naive to some extent that I thought two seats would be great, and uh, getting to fly low level was a lot of fun. I'm I'm very lucky. You've introduced me to to Brad Inslee, who who we're going to get on the channel oh, yeah. um, soon. Awesome. So he's, he's he's the high time F111 guy. So we so I'm, I'm awesome. expecting to get a sort of a thorough discussion around F111 variants from him. But mm -hmm. um, you know, FB111 mm -hmm. strategic bomber. The yeah. um, F111F was the precision bomber. The uh, the yeah. E model was the sort of digital version, if if I remember correctly. The, the D the D was the di digital. D version. was the, D was digital. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so which one did you want to fly? Did did you have a preference? Uh, well, I mean, if if you had to, uh, if if you got to pick, you kind of uh, wanted the F model because it had the paved tack pod uh, and the big engines. Uh, so it uh, it was kind of the hot rod of the F111 fleet. Um, however, it was stationed at Lake and Heath, and if you were, knew you were going to England, you wanted to go to Hayford uh, because the, the culture at the two bases couldn't have been more different. Uh, Lake and Heath was kind of a, a USAFE show base, and, and it seemed like uh, most of the kind of high and tight dudes were there. And Hayford was kind of a, a laid back uh, party, push it up, do, uh, do a lot of good stuff, but have fun when you're doing it uh, location. And so, uh, so that was the E. The, the E model was at Hayford. The F model was at Lake and E. Uh, the D model was at Cannon. And then uh, the A model that we flew at Mountain Home, uh, there was two. There was a training unit and an ops unit, although they really never did ops. They just did training. Uh, but the A, if you went to Mountain Home, you were pretty much planned to go to Hayford uh, because the A and the E were very similar platforms. Uh, the most of the changes between the A and the E were in the right seat. Uh, and then on the left hand, left seat, there was only a couple of differences, uh, like in the, in the engine intakes and uh, a couple of other very minor things. So, uh, so for a pilot, I mean, when you got to the, from the A to the E, it was basically identical. So it was nice. And you, you've already said that, that, that it was a PCS, so you, a permanent change of station to go mm -hmm. up to Mount, Mountain Home and um, convert to the F-111A. Right. Um, six, six months, did you say? What, what, what were you doing? Yeah, it was, it was about six and a half months. Mm -hmm. And what was the syllabus then? What, what did you have to actually learn? Yeah, so you get there first. It obviously starts off with uh, academics. And, and you mentioned, uh, you know, having old uh, Vietnam kind of guys there. And Brad was one of them, of course. Uh, and all of our instructors in the academic side and the systems guys and the weapons guys, they were all Vietnam vets and had flown the aircraft in Vietnam uh, during its uh, first deployment over there. So the stories were amazing. Uh, and then uh, so you start off kind of with academics on the ground uh, for several weeks, about two, three weeks of that. Um, and then you get down to the flight line, you start getting introduced to the airplane, uh, several simulators, uh, mostly emergency procedures. The F-111 uh, was a pretty complex airplane. Uh, and actually, not long before I got it, you couldn't go there as a new pilot to the 111. They only took, uh, they, they had a PWIZO program. So you went to the right seat first. And then uh, once you were, uh, you know, experienced, you could move to the left seat and fly with real WIZOs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I don't remember how many years, maybe only a couple of years, you'd been able to actually go straight to the left seat. Uh, and it was really because the plane is really complex. Uh, obviously, it was the first afterburning turbofans, first variable geometry wings, uh, first uh, very, uh, terrain following radar. Uh, so a lot, a lot of firsts in that airplane. And so it was it was complex. 
uh, the flight control system was was very complex. Uh, had a, a a complete fly-by-wire system overlaid on a mechanical uh, system. So uh, built by General Dynamics, they built the F-16. They basically took the F-111 fly-by-wire system and turned it into the F-16. They just got rid of the mm-hmm. underlying stuff uh, later. So anyway, very complex uh, aircraft. So so you did that, and then once you got down to the flight line. Uh, you started off in transition, just basically learning how stick and rotor stuff, a little bit of aerodyna- uh, aerobatics and uh, takeoffs and landings and all that. Uh, but it wasn't long. We were uh, on doing low levels and hitting the range by about rides six or seven. Uh, and a matter of fact, my first five rides were with Brad uh, and Brad was a legend. And so I think it was my very first sortie. We went up and, and it you know, you go up and you're supposed to do a little handling, just some wing overs and an aileron roll and a barrel roll or whatever. And he could tell like, well, you can fly. So he's like, do you want to go to the range? <laughs> I'm like, hell yeah. So so we uh, bootlegged a little range time and he took me down and, and we did a couple of levels, a couple of pops. And so I uh, got to see the range uh, right there on the first one. So I remember on my first range ride, I was flying with a different guy. And he goes, well, your range situational awareness is really high. I'm like, well, I've been here a couple of times. <laughs> so, but yeah, Brad was great to fly with. Great to fly with. Um, it, it'll be interesting. I think we'll, we'll probably end up covering it more in your move from a, a crew, crewed aircraft to a single seat fighter. Mm-hmm. But um, working with a Wizzo, did you, you know, so you mentioned having uh, the yeah. pilot Wizzo program, which I, I guess uh-huh. is sort of a, th- a throwback to Vietnam when right. you know, first first tour pilots were flying the backseat of the F four, and then they would right. be offered another tour if they wanted to. I, well, I think the deal was if you if you if you agreed to go back to Vietnam, we'll let you fly from the front seat. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, so. It was an interesting um, interesting uh, value exchange. But um, <laughs> how did how was that process for you in the F one eleven? Then you know, did you end up being hard crewed with a with a weapon systems officer um, for the rest of your training? Um, no, not, not directly. We, we, uh, flew with several different instructor pilots. And then once, once we had our qualification check ride, which was, uh, in the first, you know, I think we flew probably, I don't know, 20 hours or so. And then we had a, a check ride, a formate qualification check. And once we had that, we could start flying with the instructor wizards and, uh, and also student wizards. So I had a, I was hard crewed with one student wizzo that there was certain syllabus rides that we flew together as a crew. Uh, to learn together. Um, and that was probably only a handful of those, maybe uh, five to eight or something like that, um, where we flew with the crew, uh, two newbies. Um, but th- other than that, we, after your qual check, you only pretty much fly with high wizzos. Um, and that was great because they weren't really telling you how to fly. They were working more on how to employ the weapon system. Where if you know, anytime you're flying with another pilot, he's like talking about how you're flying, and I'm like, well, quit talking about how I'm gonna fly. Tell me how to drop bombs. Uh, and a, and a wizzo, wizzos don't care how you're flying unless you're gonna crash. Uh, they just they're so they're like, hey, this is, you know, put the target on. Here's get your steering straight, be on speed. You know, drop drop the best bomb you can. So I I, I felt like that was actually a really good thing is not to fly with another pilot uh, and to to have those different wizzos. Uh, perspectives and experience this is not intended to sound rude it might it might come across <laughs> as being rude but um so so if the if the the person in the right hand seat is working all the the weapon system trying to find the mm-hmm. target and and doing whatever he or she later she 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 <laughs> does um what do you what do you i mean is it is it really a, a challenge for you as the pilot to to you because you're basically following directions is that would that be a right? um t- somewhat i mean we did a lot of low level a lot of uh, navigation low level navigation and and of course they help with that uh but they're not flying the plane and not keeping it from hitting the ground so you know there's still a lot of uh flying to do and then uh, but they are working the radar they're working finding the turn points running the uh, crosshairs on the target and the and the one thing that's kind of uh, different, for example, from the F4 or maybe the F15E, is I can't see it. In the, in the 111, the, the radar screen is over in the right seat, and it's got a big, uh, what we used to call the feed bag. They stick their head in the feed bag. I, I can't see it. So uh, so that was somewhat of a challenge. And and actually, I you know, uh, busted a check ride because the, of that. Uh, actually, my first uh, mission check at Hayford when I was uh, got to Hayford, um, my MR check, uh, the Wizzo was 
using an offset bomb. And so he was putting the bars on a, on a uh, pier. Uh, and so the end of the pier was where he needed to put it. And then we offset to the target, which is not a hard technique, but, but there was apparently a ship on the pier. So it was extended the length of a ship, you know, five, four or 500 feet. And so the in no show target, uh, it pulled us off. So, so I flew, no kidding, the steering, I was exactly where the steering said to be, but we missed because, uh, and th that was on a, you know, a nuclear strike check ride. So you can't miss. And, uh, that's why I busted, but, uh, we were able to fix that up later and, and, you know, keep going, but, but yeah, that was, uh, so your point is, no, you can't, you can't fix his problems uh, unless you can see it visually. And uh, on those kind of things where it's a no-show target and in that kind of area, you can't see the target. So, uh, so I couldn't help. But. You, you mentioned um, you know, it being a nuclear strike check, right? Can, can you talk a little bit about the missions then of the F-111 at, at, at Hayford? Um, what, you know, what were sure. you there to do? Yeah, well, we, we had several missions. Uh, we were primarily there uh, to fulfill our PSYOP role, which, you know, the nuclear role, uh, and uh, be part of uh, part of that whole thing. So so when we got to Hayford, your first uh, mission MR check is a, is a nuclear strike profile. And then we'd also have to uh, certify uh, nuclear strike lines. So you had to, you know, show that you knew how to do it. We had a lot of exercises that were focused on that, uh, that role. And so that was really our primary reason to be in England. Uh, of course, as uh, you safety assets, we were also had a conventional uh, attack role, uh, primarily in the uh, Fulda Gap or, you know, in the uh, Germans are coming across the line uh, scenario. We were prime. That was our primary secondary role. Uh, and of course, back then in the 80s, uh, the wall was just coming down. But that's what we all were uh, working for. Uh, everybody was looking at that mission. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, if we weren't doing nuke training, we were doing that training. Uh, and to be honest, that's why kind of a combination of those two roles was one of the reasons we were in Turkey uh, right before the war kicked off. Um, and we could talk about that more if you want to go there now. But uh, but yeah, the, the reason we were in Turkey was uh, as part of 4th ATAF uh, Air Force or what's ATAF, uh, Allied Tactical Air Forces, that region, uh, we had a role to also fly out of Insulik, uh for strike, potential strikes for NATO. Uh, so we had to go there every year uh, just to do FAM sorties and fly around uh, Turkey to be proficient to do that mission if, if required. Uh, so we called them our weapons training deployments and, and we did it every year. Uh, so I, I actually arrived in England on June 1st, 1990, and we deployed to Turkey at the end of July uh, for our weapons training deployment uh, about mid-July. Uh, and all three of our 111 squadrons out of Hayford rotated through that cycle that summer. And so we were there doing WTD when uh, Saddam invaded Kuwait uh, on August 2nd. So we, we were like going, what the hell just happened? And, and then we got extended. They're like, "Well, why don't you all just stay there?" Uh, and so we did. We'll, we'll come back to that in a bit. But yeah, um, just going back then to to that sort of the nuclear strike mission. Um, I, I did interview somebody, uh, an F an F one eleven F pilot from from Lake mm -hmm. last year, and he he'd said that his um, psyop target were the sub pens at Mamansk, um, and mm -hmm. he said that their their profile meant that when they drop the weapon they'd have about a minute or two of fuel and then they would run out yeah. of gas did you have a similar um challenge ahead of you was was it something you contemplated a lot yeah well uh, I, I don't know if i contemplated a lot because it really wasn't worth contemplating uh but yeah i mean that was the that was the profile we we would go uh and the the way that the nuclear strike lines were is if you had enough fuel to get to the target plus 100 miles you go uh, and so it, there wasn't a landing has to happen uh, criterion. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I, I always kind of didn't expect to, to probably make it uh, and not because I thought I'd get shot down. But when, you know, if the PSYOP were to happen, there's so many nuclear detonations going off. 
I don't know how we're going to not get hit by one. <laughs> so I kind of uh, never expected probably to make it to the target um, in, in that scenario. Uh, and of course, you, you, if you talk to other guys, you probably know we, we would seal up the cockpit. Uh, so yeah, you, we used to, you know, you have the, the Victor alert song. I don't know if you've ever heard it. Uh, oompa, 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 oompa. But uh, anyway, one of those, uh, one of those verses is, you know, we're all sealed up uh, shields all are all up and the curtains are drawn. So, so as a joke, sometimes we would, we would, close up the cockpit while you're on the wing and you could, we had a little uh, door that would open up so you could see the HUD in case you had to visually do it. And then you'd put an eye patch on. So you only lost one eye. Uh, but, uh, but you would, <laughs> we would seal it up while you're on the wing and you'd be flying and kind of totally leaned forward, just looking through the little crack. And then the, you know, the wizard and the other jet would look over and go, Hey, knock it off, man. You <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, it's so funny. But yeah, you could seal the dang thing up, so it was pretty tight, and uh, and then fly, you know, low level. That that was the beauty of the TFR. I mean, the thing was so awesome. Uh, you could you didn't have to be able to see. You could fly uh, two hundred feet at six hundred knots, and you didn't have to be able to see outside at all. So so presumably you would have had to have flown initially at a high level, um, just from a, a sort of mm -hmm. fuel cons conservation right. point of view or an economy yeah. point of view. You know, we really take off with uh, external tanks, uh, fly high, drop the tanks, and then yeah, drop in uh, at designated location, drop in low, and then you were pressing in low the whole rest of the way. And, and did you have? Uh, uh, were you hard crew? Did you have a the, the same wizzo that you would fly with all the time? Not uh, not. Uh, the only time I was hard crewed uh, was actually in the spin up to Desert Storm and through Desert Storm. I, I only flew with one guy uh, from basically, I think it was around uh, October of 90 through February, end of Febu or February of 91. Uh, I flew with Major uh, Gretch Gretchanik, who was just a great dude. Uh, we got along super, and, and he was my crewed wizzo. I, I was the youngest pilot in the squadron that was there, uh, so I was lucky to have a good, experienced guy uh, that was my crewmate because, as I said, you know, we, I got to England on June 1st, and we deployed in the middle of July, and then uh, we ended up coming back for a very short period because I actually had to get my MR check, um, and one of our other squadrons needed their rotation, so they sent them in. I think it was the 77th. Uh, went in behind us. We got extended for a couple of weeks, and then they came in, did three weeks, and then we got redeployed uh, because the Tigers were the A squadron in the wing. And once it looked like we were probably going to go, uh, they wanted us back there. So we redeployed in October or September, might have been end of September. Uh, we redeployed back to Turkey, and uh, then we were there the whole time. So, so can we talk a little bit about the the capabilities, the the war fighting capabilities of the F one eleven? Yeah. Then, um, you know, if you if you were giving a capabilities briefing about the airplane, what what sort of things would you be talking about? What, what sort of things would you be saying? Uh, well, it's it's super fast, uh, very very capable in uh, airspeed. Plus, uh, the variable geometry wings give it a, a lot of different capabilities uh, with with speed and uh, and ability to, uh, especially down low, just really get up and go. Um, the uh, TFR makes it very, very capable at night, low level. Um, so, you know, obviously you can do that hands off and uh, very fast. You, you can TF down to 200 feet up to 1.2 Mach. Uh, so you can, uh, you can rip through a lot of terrain <laughs> uh, at very low altitude. And uh, so it's, it's extremely capable. And then a lot of gas, carried 30,000 30, pounds internal fuel. Internal fuel. Uh, so that gives you a a high, low, high, easy three hour, two and a half, three hour uh, duration without refueling. Uh, and a matter of fact, during Desert Storm, I never actually had to get gas. We did go get gas a couple of times and it was a cluster because, you know, you show up at the tanker and everybody's there. Uh, the first time I had, to, the first time I got gas during Desert Storm, I didn't need it. But once I waited so long to get gas at the tanker, I had to have it. <laughs> so I was like, why did we even come over here? But, uh, but yeah, so it was, uh, very capable for duration and that was no external tanks. Uh, we could carry external tanks as well. Um, large range of different kinds of weapons that it was capable of carrying, uh, all everything conventional, um, plus, you know, uh, nuclear stuff. 
Uh, there was an internal weapons bay that you could actually carry stuff in. We actually could carry a fuel tank in there so you could have extra gas with no drag, um, which we never did. Uh, it actually had a gun pod that could be mounted in there. Uh, they did it during Vietnam. And uh, the, the cool thing of that is it had a giant ammo drum uh, and it was canted three degrees down. So you could do level strafe at 200 feet, uh, which was sweet. And uh, that would have been really cool. I wish I would have gotten to do that, but it was kind of phased out by the time I got to the 111. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of amazing combat capabilities uh, and, you know, the, and especially the TFR, I mean, the TFR was just incredible. Um, could go from, you know, 25,000 feet down to 200 feet with a combat descent at night and not see a thing. Right. <laughs> what, what's, what's that, what's it like then, uh, the experience of, of doing that? Yeah. I mean, during, if it was day VMC, we would do combat descent, uh, like anybody else, you know, roll over, pull a well nose down. Uh, probably supersonic on the way down and then pull and then you know level off uh gradually uh down to whatever you're comfortable with hand flying but at, at night uh you just engage the auto tfr uh and we'd set it at a thousand at the tfr we had a set clearance planes we call it so what you what do you want to fly at uh and it was 200 300 400 500 750 and a thousand and then the uh it had ride selection it was called uh hard, medium, or soft. And what that really commanded is how hard the aircraft pushed over uh, when it cleared terrain. A hard ride was negative one G. Um, so it was, a, it was kind of, no kidding, a, a rough ride uh, down on the deck. Medium is what we normally flew. Soft uh, was a, kind, a nice gentle bunt. And so really it, what it did was control how close you stayed to the ground when you crossed an obstacle. Um, so those were the different settings. So if I was like at uh, 25,000 feet and went auto TFR, you basically let go, pull the power back because you're going to get fast. It, it pitches over depending on what ride setting you select at that given negative G uh, down to 10 degrees nose low. Uh, it'll hold the 10 degrees nose low until the radar altimeter rings in at 5,000 feet. And when that happens, it pitches over harder <laughs> Be oh. because now it knows where the ground is. Uh, and so it, it'll pitch over to um, 12 degrees is what it's set at. But it feels when, you, when you're at 5,000 feet and the jet pitches, you're like, whoa. Uh, and then it, uh, we would set it at 1,000 and it would you know, start to, as soon as it gave climbing commands and started to pull the nose up, you just ring it down to wherever you want to go because uh, now you know it's commanding. Uh, and then we had a, we had a scope um, that was on the actual radars. The, the TFR had its two radars uh, that were dedicated, and they were redundant, uh, a backup. And so you could see that scope, uh, it's a separate scope in the in the jet, and you could see the terrain and uh, what we called a ride line. It was basically a wavy line, and that represented your flight path with distance. And as long as nothing was penetrating the ride line, no terrain is going through the ride line. Uh, when it gets within, uh, I think it was three or five miles, then you knew you weren't going to hit it. Um, so you paid attention as it got in closer, and as, and as long as then it dropped below the ride line, uh, you're not going to hit it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, But it, it, it's an extremely, extremely uh, good system. The, the, the radar itself only commanded for climb up things within two degrees of the nose. Uh, so I, I tell a, this is an amazing story. When I was at Mountain Home going through training, there was a Snake River Canyon that was close to the Sailor Creek Range, which is where we drop bombs. I was on a night ride uh, with an eye wizzo. And uh, that canyon was just off the black line to the right, but you often would be close to it or go in it. Uh, I was in it at night, uh, didn't know until I had the 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 beacon was going like red, 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 flashing off the walls of the canyon. And uh, we were down in it uh, at 400 feet and canyon walls above us in the dark. Uh, and the TFR was fat, dumb and happy because there was nothing in front of us for a little ways. Uh, and then when the when the river turned, it, you know, it just climbed us right on out of there. Uh, so amazing system. So, so the, the it will fly the aeroplane um, along a track, a ground track. Can it so it can make turns? It can no, it. no. But it, it it's um, the pilot would turn. So um, 
because the flight control system was fully integrated into the TFR, the TFR only gave uh, positive and negative G. Um, when we hit turn points, uh, you would manually turn the aircraft or you could spin in the heading on your, uh, on your HSI, just spin in the next heading and the airplane would then do a 30 degree bank turn to the next heading. Um, if you exceeded the bank in the turn, uh, that it can't see far enough into the turn, it would give you a fly up command. So, so if you, uh, if you went over, like, I think it was 45 degrees of bank, uh, while you're auto TFing, it would give you a fly up, uh, because it's like, Hey, I, I, I'm not saying there's something there, but I can't see far enough to not hit it. Uh, so. So you'd have to, you, I mean, you would need to know where you were because if you were in that canyon yeah. and you rolled on some bank um, yeah. and the, it's all terrain, it might actually pull you into the uh, opposite it, side. Yeah, it would have. It could have, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that. but uh, the canyon, you know, was straight for a while and, and then it curved. And, and when it curved, it could see the wall. And then when it needed to, it, you know, for because it was had to get over it, then that's when it climbed. Uh, but yes, if I would have tried to turn in the canyon, <laughs> it probably would have given me a fly up as soon as it saw the train, and uh, that could have been <laughs> that could have been bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a lot of trust then. I mean, there's there's mm. some cross tracking. You're looking at the e scope. That that's yeah. Of, um, you know that that pathway. Um, and you're trusting your wizard that, that he knows where you are and he's not going to. Yeah. Well, the, the matter of fact, it's funny that you say that because when I saw the thing flashing, I said to the wizard i go hey dude i think we're in a canyon and there was a little flap on the on the side of the feedback so he opened it up and he goes yeah look and you could see that the radar was just you know there was only about that much that was you could see and it was just black on the sides because the radar was sweeping the whole way there just wasn't uh, any uh anything to see because it was just hitting the walls uh so he knew we were there uh i didn't but he he i guess he didn't tell me but uh, but yeah, when I said, dude, I think we're in the canyon, look at the lights. He's like, oh yeah, look at the radar. <laughs> so, what, what, uh, what were the challenges then of that conventional mission? What, what were, you know, how, what, what sort of circular error probable were you working with? How close to the target could you get your yeah. bombs? You know, what um, the, <laughs> it's funny, you know, the, the ballistics, everything in the aircraft is set for real weapons. Um, so, so anytime you dropped a real weapon, it was always better. Um, so when we dropped practice bombs, you know, the, the ballistics for a BDU-33, you know, a 25 pound little blue bomb, they're not really in the airplane. So it simulated a uh, Mark 82 uh, slick or Mark 84 slick. I mean, it's always good for training. Uh, but every single time I dropped heavyweights in training, it was a shack every single time. Uh, and so... I would much rather drop real weapons because the airplane was programmed for those weapons and it knew the ballistics uh, cold. Uh, so e even high drag, I mean, uh, my first heavyweight drop in at Mountain Home was, uh, we had eight uh, loaded slant four Mark 82 airs. So the ones with the balutes and uh, came in and we actually had a string of eight vehicles and so we put the dimpy in the middle and they were evenly spaced and I calculated it and set the inner velometer. So potentially I could hit out every one of them and no kidding. It did. <laughs> there was, there was a parachute sticking out of the back of every truck uh, after we went by and I was blown away. And, uh, but that wasn't an uncommon experience when we dropped heavies. Um, and then over in England, we would drop uh, what we called shapes, uh, BDU 38s, which was a nuclear trainer. Um, and we did that over at Lee Horse Range in Holland, uh, mostly. And every time I dropped in one of those, it was a shack. Um, it, and that's a, in a lay down, a lay down uh, delivery, which is a very fast uh, 200 foot drop, uh, usually 600 plus knots. Um, but yeah, every time I dropped one, it was a shack. So, so uh, it was very good. It was very capable. And, and, and that's with the primary delivery of radar bombs. So we would normally, uh, we always planned to not be able to see. Um, so if you could, then you'd back it up with a visual with the HUD and, and do a visual backup, uh, which was helpful because, you know, if there was any air with where the, where the uh, WISO had the, the crosshairs, you could, you know, hey, we need to come a little, little bit left because I can see it. Uh, and that was always helpful. But, uh, but you know, Back in the day, we, we didn't do precision. Uh, the F models did. They had a, an LG, LGBT uh, care, 
uh, capability. We didn't. Um, so it was going to be a uh, conventional weapon. Uh, but that's why you dropped a lot. <laughs> so we always dropped a string. You know, if you, if you need one, then drop four uh, because one of them will probably hit. And uh, the other ones that don't hit where you wanted them to go are still going to hit bad guy land. And that's cool. So that was kind of the philosophy. And it, it was a, it was more precise than obviously, uh, you know, carpet bombing in World War Two. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we also didn't have a problem with dropping more than we needed. From a, uh, a sort of mechanical uh, point of view, then you, you mentioned the HUD a couple of times. And I suppose it would be uh, true to say that the F 111 had a sort of lead computing optical site rather yes. than a HUD in the traditional sense. So you didn't have exactly. a full line and a, a little pipper and, you know, CCRP, CCIP right. yeah, capabilities. No, exactly. No, no, no real instrumentation and not a HUD like the, like the Eagle at all. Um, just uh, bombing uh, information. Uh, a locus lead computing optical site yes and uh and some steering we had bars in there for steering uh but mostly for the the pitch bar was uh would be up there when we were on tfr and tell me what commands were coming out of the tfr uh and we also had audio for that um so uh high pitch boops were uh climbs and low pitch boops were descents. so so the tfr talked to you and you had visual representation in the in the HUD for that. And then steering, your steering bar was there when you were doing a radar bomb, uh, any kind of navigation you had steering uh, to center. Uh, that was also down in the cockpit on the ADI, um, but it was repeated up in the in the uh, heads up site. But not a HUD, not not at all like the Eagle. Not uh, when, my, when, when, I, when my WIZO locked somebody up with the air to air function of the radar, nothing, <laughs> nothing on my side. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't very helpful. Uh, he'd go, yep, he's to the right and 24 miles away. I'm like, okay. But, uh, speaking of which then, um, that was presumably more useful for finding the tanker than it was for. It was good for up. tankers. But you, you mm. could carry aim nine, couldn't you? We did. Uh, we carried papas. So stern aspect only, uh, and, uh, not very useful. Um, it was very, actually when I went to the AT 38, when we trained with the AT 38, we basically said the, uh, a 10 to 10 uh, mil circle around the upper eyebrow on the, on the gun site was where you'd put the aim nine. Uh, that was about what we did in the F one eleven. So you, you basically pull them to a certain spot in the, uh, in the heads up display there and you'd get a growl. And if you got a growl, you'd let it go. Um, but, but yeah, you couldn't shoot anybody in the face with it. Uh, really that wasn't a capability. And uh, they had, they'd have to basically roll out your formation, which happened occasionally uh, during a central enterprise. And I was actually, I went to TLP um, over at Florenz, Belgium. Uh, I did that course. And, and I had a couple of times where people rolled into the middle of the gorilla and I was like, oh, okay, boom, uh, A9 dead. Um, so so it, it, was a, it wasn't a offensive weapon. It was a, yeah, we had it. Matter of fact, during Desert Storm, they took them off the jets. They're like, we don't even want you to think about it. Uh, we were flying at night. It didn't really matter. Uh, but yeah, they said, yeah, we don't want you accidentally shooting somebody. Uh, you guys really don't know what you're doing with it. And that was <laughs> probably a given. <laughs> I mean, just statistically, the the number of aircraft in Iraqi airspace yeah. was, over, was overwhelmingly coalition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And especially at night, there was really not too many folks up besides us. So, so, so you, so you, you've uh, sort of brought us back on track then to talk about um, you know, Desert Shield, which was the the initial mm -hmm. August August to January preparation for um, you know convincing Saddam Hussein to get out of uh, Kuwait, um, yep. and then you know, January seventeen on onwards was Desert Desert Storm, the actual uh, sort of shooting war. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned already you were the the youngest pilot on the squadron. Um, mm -hmm. How how were you feeling about the prospect of going to war? Um, did you feel invincible? Did did death come? You know, I mean, you know, f flying fighters is a dangerous sure. business. You know, people die all the time. That's just how it is. But uh, what, what was going through your mind? Yeah, well, right after Saddam invaded, I mean, and we got extended, um, we were kind of excited to be honest. And and uh, so there was me and one other guy, Woody Yarbrough who was a academy classmate of mine. And I say I was the youngest, he, he was a little bit older than me, but we were both uh, the same age uh, in the jet. So we both got there at the same time and, and went over together. Uh, so Woody and I were uh, the youngest guys and they hooked us up with a couple of young Wizzos. 
and they said, hey, we might be going to war. Uh, here's some targets. I want you guys to do some uh, combat planning and, and uh, figure it out. So, so we did uh, some tabletop exercises on potential targets and, and presented them to the wing in, in a uh, kind of a wing uh, crew, crew meeting kind of thing at there at Insulik. And uh, we actually ended up going after one of the targets that we thought we might. Um, being up in the north was kind of interesting because, as I mentioned, we were there until I think about mid-August, and then we went back to Hayford. Uh, the squadron redeployed. I got my MR check, which I failed and then passed. Uh, and then uh, then we went back in the end of September. Um, so when when we left, you know, the why we got extended, it was kind of – who knows what's going to happen? Uh, they were talking about build up. There was a couple of folks were headed to Saudi, but nobody was coming to Turkey. Uh, and so when we left, it was kind of, we'll see what happens. Uh, it wasn't eminent. Um, I would say, even though there was saber, saber rattling. Uh, but by the time September came around, we were kind of biting at the bit to get back because we we're like, Hey, if we don't get back soon, we may never get, in uh and so turkey was unique in in that really nobody was talking about us and it was all you safety folks uh so all the TAC guys uh you know out of eglin and and other folks were all going to saudi um the f-111 f's out of lake and Heath went down to saudi uh we sent a couple of our spark barks from hayford down to saudi uh and we had a couple with us at instrulic uh, but for the first few months of desert shield up there we were just doing training and kind of uh, kind of talking about what would happen if we ended up getting to go. Uh, they were starting to come up with some of these ideas, calling us the 7440th Composite Combat Wing up there. And then they, uh, they came up with a pro uh, Joint Task Force Proven Force, uh, which we were starting to become. Uh, and in, in, as December kind of came around, it started to look like, okay, maybe we're going to do something because other folks started to show up. Uh, so we had some Schusterberg Eagles show up and some uh, Bitburg squad and the Tigers out of 5-2 came down, uh, at least some of them. I think some of them might have already been down in Saudi, but uh, we had about, I think, about 12 of them show up uh, from Bitburg. And then the uh, CJs showed up, uh, the Hunter Killer F4S 16 CJs. I don't think there were CJs yet, just Cs. Uh, but they uh, they showed up from uh, from Torhon, uh, and then it started looking like, well, crap. Looks like you know maybe we are going to do something. And so we started training together uh, as a composite group, and and that was great. So we started uh, doing large force kind of exercises uh, out over the 50 mile circle around Inserlik, which I don't know if you're familiar, maybe you are, but th there was a 50 mile ring around the Inserlik Tacan where we could kind of do almost anything we wanted. Uh, and then if we left that, we had to have broader Turkish clearance. Konya range was well outside of there. It was about 150 miles away. So if we were going to go out to the range, it was going to be uh, a bigger uh, event, uh, but we still did. So we'd do some stuff in the 50 mile circle and we'd run out, uh, out to Konya and drop some bombs. And we were doing a lot of night training because we knew we were going to end up going at night. Um, so that, I think development of that composite wing concept that uh, was kind of new again, I think it'd been something that the Air Force had done in previous combat uh, operations, but putting everybody at one place uh, at the numbers that we were, which was kind of large package numbers, uh, was kind of unique again. And so the spin up, uh, probably not until mid December into that beginning of January. Uh, was was good it was when we really started thinking you know hey we're gonna go um we were still kind of second fiddle and and afterthoughts from the aocs down in riyadh they weren't talking to us uh, so we were doing a kind of our own planning we had intel folks and we just like, like well where's all the long long distance search radars and the weapon systems so we know we're gonna have to take out their eye ads the first few nights uh and so we just started targeting and building strike packages for uh for day and night uh, and we had kind of figured out that the the F-16s were going to do day strikes and the 111s were going to do night strikes. Uh, and so we just basically built it. Um, and then once uh, it got within a few days, uh, there was some political machinations with the Turks not totally wanting us to fly from Turkey uh, on the first night. So we, we actually didn't fly the first night out of Turkey. Uh, the Turks allowed us 
on the second night. The 18th was the first night for uh, uh, Desert Storm North. Um, but Schwarzkopf decided he wanted a northern front just to for really just to make sure that they didn't reposition things more things down south. Uh, but other than that, I don't think they cared what we did uh, as long as we didn't go south of Baghdad. <laughs> so they're like, you guys just stay north uh, and take care of whatever kind of you want. So we would we would basically do their targeting and submit it down to the south. Say, here's what we're going to do tonight, and they would more or less bless it. Or, or repackage it on the ATO and send it back to us. Um, so it was kind of cool. We were semi-autonomous and nobody was really talking about us. Uh, so, I mean, all the press was in down south, and uh, <laughs> uh, which was totally fine with us. What, um, I mean, it's, it's easy to, especially nowadays, think of the F-16 as being, you know, a, a very sophisticated, um, very capable, you know, fourth generation fighter. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, it was just the same as the F-111, right? It was a bomb truck um, back yeah. in, in 1991. It was, um, you know, but it had a proper HUD. Um, and it carried very, yeah. very, 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 very few number of bombs. Right. Um, but, but what and was always the... And always needed gas. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the... Um, you know how how did a strike package then work? A, a composite package work, um, particularly around hunter killer um, mm -hmm. suppression of any enemy air defenses or destruction of enemy air defenses. Yeah, how were you working with those guys, especially given that you were flying at night too? Yeah, we we only flew at night, and I think uh, I had mentioned to you before that uh, I, I actually didn't fly the first uh, several days because I was a lieutenant, and uh, and so I got put on a uh, mission planning cell with me and Gretch were on a uh, mission planning cell. So I did planning for the first five days. Uh, so I was doing strike packages and all the targeting and weaponeering and stuff like that, which was actually great learning. Uh, I was bummed I wasn't flying, but, uh, but um, I learned a ton. So it was actually valuable. Um, but, uh, but the way it worked was basically we had, we had the C models, we had the hunter killer guys, we had uh, some EF-111s to do uh, electronic warfare. We had some, uh, we had compass call, got a couple of C-130 compass calls there to do some comms stuff. And then we had uh, tankers, we had an AWACS, and, uh, and then we had the strikes, uh, strikers. So at nights it was us, and during the day it was the, uh, the Vipers. And they usually did two Dagos, and then we would do the nights. And uh, we had, I think we had 18 jets there, or 20, something like that. And we would fly about 12 a night um, was our normal night uh, go. Uh, so basically, we just set it up like like you would expect. We, you know, vol time started up. The Eagles went in right behind them. You had the uh, hunter killers, and they would get on station and be ready to do uh, strikes or harms, depending on which weapon system they had. We still had some strikes around. Uh, and then you'd have the, the uh, spark marks go in and set up their orbits. And then we would press fence in and, you know, head into the target area, drop the bombs and head back out. Um, as I said, we, we didn't need gas really. So you'd let the, uh, the F4s, the F16s and the F15s get gas. And we would try just to stay clear uh, of the tanker and go back home. Um, so the first week or so we were low, we were coming in on TFR uh because that's what we trained and uh and hitting uh weapon sites and uh mostly radar facilities other uh, search radars and taking out their iads uh so that was you know again pretty standard targeting that was the first few nights uh and then after we got rid of most of that it switched to uh different kinds of targets um nuclear research and development facilities weapons storage facilities uh, fuel storage facilities, uh, command and control bunkers, uh, and command and control locations that uh, were deeper in uh, the Baghdad area or at airfields. Uh, we hit a lot of airfields, um, especially at night, uh, because they weren't taken off much at night. Uh, so the group, the aircraft would be on the ground, and so we're we're just taking them out on the ground. Uh, again, not uh, LGB capable, so we weren't doing what they you know, plinking. Uh, tab V's like they were down in the south with the F models, uh, but we were taking out their ramps and, and runways and stuff like that. Uh, there, there was one night they wanted us to fly Durandale. Uh, I was going to ask you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're like, no, <laughs> we're not. Why not? Straight, because you fly straight. In uh, you got to fly them. straight down the runway at uh, at pretty low altitude. It was kind of a stupid weapon, kind of like JP two three three. But. Uh, 
but yeah, we just were like, no, we just rather drop it. You know, we could put some two thousand pounders in and be just as effective. So, so Durandal, just for anybody who's not familiar with this, was a, a parachute retarded pen- runaway penetration weapon, right. like, a bit like yeah. a missile, didn't it? it was, uh, yeah, basically a large missile uh, with a parachute. It would swing down and then the mo- rocket motor would fire and go subterranean and then blow a big hole in the runway. Yeah. Uh, but we found that, uh, you know, you put a penetrator fuse on a Mark 84 and a 2000 pounder does a pretty good job. So uh, <laughs> it was and it was a lot safer and easier to carry. So, so were you on these strike missions? Were you flying as a formation? Were you flying singletons? Uh, we would, we would sometimes. Be, well, we usually flew out in formation, and then uh, in the one eleven, you know, often this the actual attacks end up being uh, split up. Uh, so uh, normally we would split, and you're pretty much a singleton. Uh, if when we're low, it's you know eight mile trail or or something, or offset. Uh, and the reason for eight miles really is because if you're closer than that, the TFR will climb off the guy in front of you. Um, if you're directly behind him, it would actually see him. And, you know, if I have 400 foot set and so does he, I'm going to be at 800 feet because it sees him. Uh, and that was a problem. So he had to be <laughs> far enough away where that didn't happen. Um, so that was really kind of that. And, and it was at 480 knots. It's basically one minute spacing, which was, a good safe distance for weapons effects. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so we normally would go out in formation together and then do some kind of action uh, to split uh, for the actual attacks and then work our way back together uh, coming out and join back up on the way home. What was the what was the resistance like then? Had, had the Iraqis also left uh, the Northern Front um, unprotected? Yeah. No, they, they had a lot of uh, AAA. And, and of course, you know, my, my scale is relative because was, that's all I'd ever seen. But um, one of our guys, uh, Major Rutschow, Pup, Puppy Chow Rutschow, he had flown Sandys in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, so I think it was my first or second mission and we were stepping out together. I, I guess it was my first one. And, and he said, uh, hey, this is my 111th mission and I'm in an F-111. This is going to be great. And, and I and I'm like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. I'm sure it's going to be cool. You know, I think it was my first one. So, so we got out there, and, and there was a there was a lot of AAA. I mean, not necessarily guided. They were just shooting. Uh, actually, it was a funny story. We put it in our do for book. But one of our intel briefs before the war uh, had looked at the Iraqi military, and you know, this third largest army in in the area, and then uh, and a pretty significant air force lots of uh, Soviet SAMs and AAA pieces. So we, we anticipated there'd be a pretty formidable uh, threat. <laughs> and they, they had a write-up in, in this Intel briefing that said that uh, Saddam had promised them a Mercedes for every aircraft they shot down, their, their AAA gunners. And, and the funny part was that the Intel analyst at the time put beats a leather jacket in uh, parentheses in the brief uh, and we just laughed our asses off. So we had to cut that out and stuck it in the doofer book. Um, but but I, I think that that led to basically whether they knew they were going to hit anything or not, they were going to shoot it. <laughs> so they were just shooting. Uh, so any any AAA piece that was down there, uh, ZSU 234, uh, S60, you know, 57 millimeters, they, they were just firing them. Uh, and so you had a lot of barrage AAA, uh, even some curtain AAA that was just up in the area that they, I guess, assumed you might be going. Uh, and then they shot a lot of missiles that weren't guided um, or they were initially guided, but then they dropped because, you know, you'd get a Magnum call and it just spike dropped and and uh, whether or not, you know, the Magnum ended up hitting the place or not, they didn't matter because the missile went dumb. Uh, so so they were, uh, they were shooting a ton. Uh, and the end of that story was when we got back that night, uh, I, Saw Puppy Chow and I'm like, hey, it was it was pretty good, and he goes, shit, there was more AAA out there than I ever saw in Vietnam. I think he only flew in the daytime at Vietnam <laughs> as a Sandy, so he probably didn't see it all. But uh, but yeah, they they were shooting a lot, just not very effective. Did you have a lot of that? It goes back to what we talked about right at the beginning of the interview in terms of the influence from the the, the sort of the, the greybeards from Vietnam. Um, mm-hmm. So was there a lot of pep talk and stuff going on? Um, you know, were you? Um, I don't know. I mean, we we were emotions something that you were allowed to have and share. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think they were suppressed or anything. And I and I I mean, I was 
I was nervous the first one. I'm, you know, I wasn't afraid to say it. I told Puppy Child I was a little nervous, and and uh, my wizard knew I was a little nervous. Of course, again, like I said, I did NPC for the, you know, planning cell for the first five days. So my first sortie was on the 23rd of January, and uh, so we were already at medium altitude, which we hated because you know that wasn't how we trained, uh, and we were less confident with dumb bombs that we were going to hit what we were aiming at. Uh, from medium altitude uh so i didn't actually get the uh tfr through the you know happy valley that we called it uh the triple a valleys uh that some of my bros did the first couple of nights um but the uh, i think it was my third mission we were going after a command post uh near kirkuk airfield uh that was out in the desert mobile command post and uh because it was in the middle of the desert and there wasn't anything around it uh, we needed a good update on the way. And so we used Saddam Dam, which was up in the mountains there. And uh, at the time, they did not know that it was heavily defended because he had a nuclear research and development facility near it that was powered by that uh, uh, by that dam. So um, when one went across there at medium altitude, it just, everything lit up. I mean, we had just AAA up the wazoo uh, right in front of me. And so, yeah, I told Gretch, I go, dude, take a look. And he, he pulled his head out of the feed bag and went, don't tell me that. And he stuck it back in and made sure our uh, crosshairs were good. And, and uh, I was supersonic as we went through there, but uh, uh, we didn't, we didn't get hit. The guys behind me were able to kind of circumnavigate it, which was nice. But, uh, but yeah, so there was a lot of stuff that we still maybe didn't know. Um, but that night uh, it was a nice clear night. I was dropping combined effects munitions, CBU 87. And uh, so they, it worked really well. We, we watched the pattern hit, hit the targets. It was a full moon night. And uh, so I, I saw them take out those things and a, and a ZSU 23-4 that was shooting at me at the time. I watched it go down. So that was kind of cool. Did you, um, I, mean, I mean, that is the thing, isn't it? Uh, about being a, 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 an aviator in war is that to some degree, I mean, unless you're getting into a fight with somebody and you shoot them down, yeah. it's it's very impersonal, isn't it? Was, was yeah. there a, a sense of it being surreal? You go out there, watch that sort of twinkling on the ground as the bomblets go off and then come yeah. back home and have some beers? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, quite honestly it was. And and I, I, I wrestled with it, I think, more afterwards um, than in the moment. Uh, and I, I kind of always came back to the conclusion that, hey, if they didn't shoot at me, it would have really been bad. <laughs> but but since they were shooting at me, <laughs> you know, I didn't feel as bad. Uh, but you know, and then and this jumps way forward. But when I was in the uh, in the wild boars flying eagles, you know, our our, uh, our motto for the squadron was air superiority, uh, overwhelming air superiority on demand, and that was what we wanted to be overwhelming. Uh, so so going in with way more. Uh, capability than the enemy had uh is not something you we should you know really kind of be bummed about <laughs> i mean that's a, that's a good thing and uh and i think we saw that in desert storm we uh we way outclassed them did you have any um particularly difficult missions was there, are there any sort of standout moments where you felt particularly challenged or, or threatened um that 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 one coming over the dam was uh, was one uh, and then i had another one uh that was on the northern outskirts of baghdad that we it was kind of a funny story we actually uh flew over to the iranian border and turned uh along the iranian border to head south and then we attacked back uh, uh, westerly which was not the norm so we that's why we planned it that way uh, but while we were driving down the Ira Iranian border, the, they came on guard and said, aircraft uh, about to enter Iran, do not come in or you will be engaged. And uh, Gretsch said, hey, we're already being engaged over here, so who cares? Uh, but uh, we kind of flew down that border and then turned back. And, and when we did, uh, being that close to Baghdad, there was a lot of AAA. And, and there was a moment where we, we basically had a – it was curtain – uh, AAA, but it was all the way across the sky. And I'm like, hmm, you know, there's a good chance we're going to take around um, while we go through here. And we were carrying uh, four Mark 84s, uh, so four 2,000 pounders. And uh, and actually, just as we kind of got in there, it, it almost opened up like in a, in a V where, you know, the old uh, Israelis crossing the, uh, the, the Dead Sea moment. And it opened up and we just kind of went down the middle. 
uh, pickled them off and, and then took a right and left, uh, left the area. And, uh, but that one, I, I was, uh, I was kind of praying as we were approaching that before the V opened up, uh, cause it, it, there was no way to kind of get to the target and not go through there. Um, uh, ended up working out. Um, but, but other than that, I would say no, not necessarily where I felt threatened. There was, there was never really an air threat. Uh, we had the Eagles out there and I didn't look up and didn't need to. Um, the, uh, the, uh, hunter killer guys were doing a good job. You know, you'd hear the uh, Maverick calls over here and there. And, and, uh, uh, so yeah, it all kind of worked, um, on the, on my first try, I did run out of chaff and I accidentally popped a flare, uh, but that was mostly nerves, uh, because I, I probably didn't need to, but in the F-111, every time you'd get a new uh, thread on the scope, we got what's called new guy audio and it'd go like, do, 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 do. And it just said, look at the scope. And then it would tell you, you know, you'd have actual audio for the thread itself and the uh, indication, uh, SA2, SA6, whatever it was. And so every time I got new guy audio, I was popping chaff and uh, it just wasn't necessary. But the very first time I did it the, in the F-111, it's just a toggle switch and and it's up for chaff and or down for chaff up for flare, I think it was. And I, when I was, I was going chaff, 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 and I accidentally popped a flare. <laughs> and it, it was the first time I ever did one. And it... It was, it was like, holy crap, it lit up the sky and, and it, it was like, boom. I mean, you could feel it coming off the back of the jet. And I'm like, I don't ever want to do that again. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so was, I think I scared myself with my own flair uh, a bit more than most other things that night. <laughs> There's one one thing, if I'd done my research um, before this interview, I'd be able to say what, what the name of it is. But there is, there is a, a defensive system on the f-111 that i never really understood you know at the top of the fin at uh, the back there's mm-hmm. a sort of a sort of hemispheric, yeah. hemispherical shape it was, which is an infrared yeah. what, it was supposed to it was supposed to be an infrared uh basically a kind of an infrared jammer that's supposed to block infrared weapons uh, that are coming up obviously to your tail um it didn't really do anything I, I'm, I'm not even 100 percent sure that it was still a- operational uh it was developed but not uh it didn't work. <laughs> so the the most, I mean, the afterburner plume on an F-111 is 60 feet long. Uh, I don't care what's up there on the tail. If, if you're in full blower, a heat seeker is going to find you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very hot engine and, uh, and puts out a humongous flame. Uh, so you didn't really want that, that thing trucking if you thought you were in an IR threat area. Was that a... Um... A capability the Iraqis had that you were concerned about, the man pad, you know, the man portable air defense system, shoulder fired yeah. mm-hmm. SA7s and stuff. Do, do you yeah. see any of that? No. I mean, they had 7s and 14s. Um, obviously, they uh, to work those effectively at night, they either need to be queued or, or they need to see us. Uh, they didn't. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't have any real uh, evidence that they were shooting those at us. I'm sure they were during the day. Um, when they could actually see somebody, uh, and probably in the South. Um, uh, but we were never, I was never concerned about them, uh, especially a medium altitude in the dark. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they had them. It was something that we, we, uh, knew about, but I was never concerned of it. Uh, really the, the biggest thing I was concerned of, um, was 57 millimeter flock, uh, the, you know, the big stuff that just in case you get in the right spot. Uh, ZSU 23-4s, um, they were shooting a lot of those. Uh, SA-6s and SA-2s, um, they had a lot of those. Um, but again, they, they tended to be very undisciplined about tracking the weapon to, to the target. So they would, they would lock you up, they would shoot, you'd see the launch, and then they would, it would go down. Uh, and I'm convinced that the whole uh, baby milk factory thing was one of their own missiles hitting that place because they shot a ton of them. And uh, obviously, all of those came back down. Uh, so, oh, really, okay. So, and th- so this was. Um, I'm I'm racking my brain now, but this was this was a shelter that was here. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It, it was on the news during the war, and they had a sign that was hand painted "Baby Milk Factory." And we yeah. just, just laugh about that. But yeah, I, I don't think we bombed the place. I think uh, I think it was probably uh, stray returning ordnance from what they were shooting at us. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know, but uh, there was enough of it up there that that wouldn't surprise me at all. And us dropping on a uh, the wrong place that surprises me. Uh, 
you know, if you go to kind of the Chinese embassy, which I know is well off topic for us, uh, but when we uh, we hit the Chinese embassy, one of the reasons the Chinese were so convinced that we did it was they didn't believe that we would ever hit something by accident. Uh, and mm-hmm. so they were convinced that if we hit it, we must have wanted to. Uh, and that 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 uh, is largely true. You know, if we hit it, if we wanted to hit it, it was going to get hit. And if we didn't want it hit, it didn't get hit. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is that was a mis- uh, intel mistake on coordinates. So we hit where we dropped, but we didn't mean to hit that place. And uh, this is Serbia you were talking about, isn't it? Yeah, we switched the etters, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. kind of the point is, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we hit a shelter. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, along similar veins, there is that media um, misconception that if you use a laser-guided bomb or a smart yeah. weapon, and a lot of the, the terminology right. and the myths around it comes from them, it comes from the right. media, um, then you're, you're guaranteed to hit something it couldn't possibly miss, and couldn't they don't possibly. really realize that there's a maturity <laughs> curve, and even when you've got yeah. to the top of the maturity curve, um, you're still not guaranteed that everything yeah. is according to plan. So. Lasers quit, codes are wrong. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Yeah. What what, what uh, did you sort of end that uh, experience feeling like then? I mean, what, one of the things that is characteristic of, um, of of fighter air crew, I guess, let's say, um, is that they want to be able to go, having trained for many years to do something slightly mm. different for you because you were you went right. straight from your first assignment, but within a month. Um, but did you did you come away feeling validated as as a fighter pilot? Um, what did it What did it do to set you up for the rest of your career? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really good question, and and I did I. I written about it that uh, that really I felt like for me it was it was like we were just checking the blocks of the training plan like you know I, I got checked out in the airplane I got MR we did some spin up for this combat thing and then we went and did it um, but I do remember the older guys that were young enough that they weren't in Vietnam but were senior you know majors some of the lieutenant colonels uh, it was like you know wow that we were finally get to go uh, do what we've trained with for for years uh, for me it was it was like you know, steps in progression. And it just kind of went the way I, you kind of get told, you know, Hey, you better be ready to go. Okay. Well, here we go. So it happened uh, right away. But my, my first flight after the war, um, I was actually back in England and (laughs) I don't know how I got on this mission, but I was my, it was only a week after we got back. And I, I got, I went up with a Wizzo who hadn't gone to desert storm. He was uh, one of our guys that just got stuck at Hayford and didn't get back in time. So he never made it back. And uh, it was up to the Highlands restricted area. I I went up, I hit a tanker, went up to the Highlands restricted area, which for those who don't know is a low fly area in Scotland, Northern Scotland, where we could go TFR at night. So, so I get, I go to a night tanker. I go up to Highlands restricted area. We do a combat letdown. And then we low level through uh, through Scotland and go to Teen Range and drop some bombs and, and come back. It's like a three hour mission. And uh, I remember the whole time being really frustrated with the guy in the right seat that he wasn't with me. I'm like, dude, you have no sense of urgency. You're not you're not with me. Come on, man. Come on. And and uh, when I when we got back, I, I realized he didn't go to war. You know, he he didn't get that piece that really completes you and and changes your perspective. And so from that moment, I, I swore. I mean, I said, I'm I am going to use every drop of gas. They let me burn and make sure I'm ready to go the next time, because I know the enemy next time might be tougher than this one was. And so so it really, yes, validated. But because of the level of the threat, uh, changed my expectations and my prioritization for how I trained after that. Um, and so I, I really pushed it up as hard as I could, not just on the ground partying, but, but every time I flew, I was like, man, we need to, we need to make it happen and we need to get better and we need to do it right. And we need to hit, I need to never miss. I need to never be off time. Uh, and so those kind of things I really, really worked hard at. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to go to TLP. Uh, and one of the reasons I was the youngest four ship flight lead in the squadron. I was a, I was a four ship as a Lieutenant, which is unheard of. In the, wow. in the 111 world, and, and so TLP is tactical leadership, uh, and, and that's mm-hmm. it, uh, that's in Belgium somewhere, isn't it? If I remember correctly, yeah, Florence, Florence, Florence Belgium. Yeah. yeah, it used to be up at Yever, up in Germany, but uh, when I went, it was down in Florence, and and it's a uh, AFSI Air Forces uh, Central Europe uh, combined, kind of a almost a red flag for Europe. Um, so it's uh, units from all over, 
uh, NATO come and show up and, and work for a month uh, in really intense, large package uh, combat training with uh, all kinds of jets. So incredible experience. Um, more than in Red Flag, where you kind of go as a unit and fly as a unit, this was two F-111s that we brought, and we had uh, four tornadoes, uh, British tornadoes. We had uh, Mirage 3s from France. We had um, F-16s from Belgium. We had, uh, oh, shoot, who else did we have? We had F-4s from LEC. Uh, so just a big mix of airplanes. Uh, we even had Alpha Jets, German Alpha Jets, that we had to figure out how to integrate into these strike packages. Um, but we were flying all over Europe uh, doing uh, large force training and uh, incredible. Uh, opposed to, we had uh, uh, Mirage 2000s and F-16s from uh, Holland that were air-to-air -air version uh, role. And so they would be opposing us every time. And then once we've, we got towards the end, the last week was our whole class against externals. So we would go fight whoever uh, they brought up and we didn't even know who they were going to be. Uh, but then we integrated our, our air to air guys from Mirage 2000s and our uh, guys from Twenta in with us and, uh, and did a whole, you know, 18, 20 ship packages uh, around Europe <laughs> with opposed red air. Uh, it was fabulous. Fabulous. This, this might sound like a sort of an attempt to dig really, but it's, it's not. It's genu I'm genuinely curious to know. Did you end up then with sort of a stratification of those guys that have been to war and those guys hadn't, uh, who hadn't? And, and how did yeah. that manifest itself then, uh, beyond what you just explained in the cockpit? Yeah. Well, I, it, yes, there was. And there was a big push by the wing not to let that happen because um, obviously the 79th was primary and we were all there uh, with the exception of onesie twosie guys that didn't get to go or had to go back. Um, but the, the 55th, you know, didn't come at all. Uh, the 77th was actually uh, the lead squadron for AMP, our aviation modernization program. So we had a couple of airplanes on base that were amped uh, by Desert Storm, and they wanted to get them into combat to test that uh, AMP out. So we had a few crews from the 77th show up. Um, but when we got back, yeah, you know, we all had our desert camo hats and uh, – they're like, you guys aren't allowed to wear those. Uh, so there was a, uh, a us versus them somewhat uh, mentality, um, but it, it wasn't much in the Tigers because almost all of us were there. Uh, it became more of a inter-squadron in the wing rivalry, uh, which we already had, to be quite honest. Um, Hayford was a very uh, squadron rivalry place. I mean, you would – you'd rather leave than go to one of the other squadrons, especially out of the Tigers. Uh, so that was a, and it wasn't that those guys were bad guys or doing different stuff. It's just, it, we were rivals and, uh, and that's the way it was. So, so that didn't change and it probably got worse. Um, so there were, there was very few guys in the 77th or the 55th that kind of got in with the guys in the Tigers. Uh, and usually it was because they were a roommate of some tiger who was single uh, or uh, in which was a couple of cases. Um, so I, I think that probably continued, obviously, after the war. I was still there for two years, uh, and that didn't change. So, really? Uh, really? And, was, and, and did you see it at TLP then? I mean, uh, you know, the, the French were involved in, yeah. in Desert Storm and, and the British and the Americans, obviously, it's a US led effort. Yeah. Um, and there were some, you know, there was the, uh, the Kuwaiti Air Force and, and mm -hmm. so on. But the front, the uh, the Germans didn't go, and right. the Dutch. Not really, um, not really at, at TLP. And I, I think that there was there was a lot of folks who had been in combat who were offering combat experience uh, to the table. Like uh, at the time when I went to TLP, I was a two ship flight lead, and you were supposed to be a mission commander. <laughs> so uh, it was timing, and our squadron was going to Green Flag in the states, and then there was this TLP slot. And uh, I knew I'd have probably have another chance to go to Red Flag in my career, uh, so, and I probably wouldn't have another chance to go to TLP, so I asked to go to TLP. Um, but as a two-ship flight lead, I was leading 18-ship packages um, because of that. And, and because I had combat experience, and I, as a lieutenant, I was one of the youngest guys there, um, I feel like they didn't care. Um, so they still gave me the stick and said, you're, you're one today. Uh, and I'm like, shit, oh, let's do it. 
Um, so, so I think it was good in that respect, but I don't remember any of the, of the like, you know, Hey, you guys suck. You didn't go. Uh, that just didn't happen in that respect. Um, and then I think some of that could have been too, that the, the 79th was, uh, the, one of the lead units in developing the NATO tigers. And so the NATO tigers, you know, the tiger association was a, all those group of tiger squadrons all over the, all over Europe. And, and so we had that brotherhood with that too. And so the, the Twenta guys <laughs> were tigers, the Lek guys were tigers. Um, and so it was like, they were great. You know, we just had other tiger dudes there already. And, and, uh, uh, so it just didn't come up. I don't, I don't remember that coming up at all. Did, did, um, I mean, it must have, but, but in, in any sort of material way, did, did the experience change the tactics that you employed for conventional de- employment, uh, of the airplane, um, did it? Did it? I mean, did it? Did it turn anything on its head, or did you did yeah. it validate what you thought you knew how to do? I think it more validated than turned anything around. Now, of course, we hadn't done medium altitude bombing, <laughs> uh, so medium altitude dumb bombing, uh, you know, is is what it is. Uh, so we were using a lot more uh, uh, area munitions because we're dropping from altitude, so you need a broader uh, covering sometimes. We did a couple of tactics that were in in the dash one, but we never really tried. Uh, like on, on the first, I think it may be the second night, there was a radar site that was on top of a hill, and we did uh, what they as a pop to level. So you come in low level and a below a ridge line, and then you do a pop so that you're 200 feet over the ridge line to drop the weapon. Uh, and so that hadn't been we didn't really practice that prior to the war. Um, so that was one that was in the books, but we didn't really practice uh, that we did. Uh, and then uh, I think if there's anything else that kind of came up, it validated our TFR capabilities uh, that, you know, it worked uh, really well. And uh, trying to think if there was anything else. I mean, after we got back, one of the things I did, I went up to uh, Lossy Mouth and worked with the uh, Brits up there. They had um, the Jaguars. They had an LGB, t- an LGB uh, laser capability that they could buddy laze, and we I did a couple of missions up there with them, uh, practicing buddy lasing so that we could actually do precision if we needed to. Um, we worked with the ground guys some, but wasn't very good. Um, so working with the Jags was was a really good uh, uh, practice and and worked out really well. We, we go up to Northern Scotland and drop on that rock up there. I can't remember the name of it. There's a little Island. That's basically a pockmarked rock from dropping hundreds of <laughs> live weapons. Uh, so we were doing toss with them with LGBs and, and they were lazing for us. And so I think that was something that we recognized was a limitation. If we're going to be at medium altitude, we need to get more precise. Um, and so that was something. And, uh, and then, just all the different types of weapons. Oh, well, one thing we did, actually, this was interesting. Um, one of my missions was against a fuel storage facility, and we put on some altitude sensing fuses on the tail of a 2,000-pounder um, so that we could the, – the sensor was in the nose, but the fuse was in the tail. And so if you're dropping a 2,000-pounder and you want it to frag a storage tank, it needs to blow up from the tail. <laughs> so – so we were doing some altitude sensing 2000 pounder drops, which I don't think anybody had ever done that before. And we also uh, flew um, an unauthorized load pretty often, which is uh, we'd have 12 500 pounders on the brews on the outs- outboard stations. And we just stuck bombs on the inboard because they were empty. So <laughs> we were flying 14 all the time, uh, which was not an authorized load, but, we're like, why would we go with no bombs on the insides? That is, I mean, that, that, that's gutsy because there is a, there's a pretty well, I don't know if it's well known, but I've seen it a few <laughs> times video, a stores release video of an F-111 dropping stuff and it coming back up and hitting <laughs> yeah, the, I, the bottom, I, the stab and the... Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> that's that's we did, gutsy. We, we did have one jet get a hit by a uh, CBU canister because it fragged as soon as it came off and the shell got embedded in the stab. Uh, so one strike, uh, you know, self-imposed strike, uh, the, the crew didn't know it till they got back. It just, it was stuck in there, but they couldn't feel it. Um, they felt the hit, but they didn't know what it was. 
Uh, and then when they got back, there's a big hunk of crap hanging out of the right stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. My, my last uh so the, as i said i haven't I, I did the interview last year but the, the last one of the last uh, interviews i published was with uh, a guy called adam robinson who was a a, a nav a tornado nav and he mm-hmm. talked about how they lost two aircraft um um because they put a new fuse um an altitude sensing fuse right out uh, right, right out fuse mm-hmm. and the, the second bomb fused off of the first one yeah um, we never had that yeah um, i heard about those but we you know we were doing it too and uh it just didn't happen uh, for us, and uh, so that was the only time I ever used radar uh, radar fuses like that. Um, mm. Was was during Desert Storm. I never uh, practiced with them again. Uh, we we did it. It worked for us. Uh, we didn't have any. We had a couple of jets take a couple of rounds. You know, a couple of AAA hits, uh, but nothing significant and uh, nothing that ever uh, caused anything more than good stories afterwards when you found the holes. Uh, but, uh, the, the, the 111 is a, a pretty rugged airplane. Um, and, and with the flight control system, the way it was, it could, there was a lot of things that could go wrong before the pilot really even knew that the airplane was compensating for it. Um, and so the, uh, the stabs, if, if you had an imbalance in fuel, for example, the stabs would just be split and you would, you would notice that it, we had a gauge with the slabs and you could see where they were, um, but if you didn't look at that, you might not even know that you have this problem. Uh, so you, you, that's how you would find out. You're like, well, why are the stabs split? Because the airplane's flying fine. Uh, it's just the system says, I need to fly like this to do what you want. So I'm mm-hmm. flying like this. Um, and uh, obviously that would restrict your role. Um, but unless you were trying to roll, you may or may not even know. Um, so the, the airplane was very robust and, uh, and, uh, complicated but robust so uh, i was always very comfortable in it even though i had several big emergencies in it um and i I was an fcf pilot so i flew it for checkout functional check flight pilot so uh i did it flew it you know shut down engines in flight and did all the tests when it would come out a major phase and stuff like that Um, but i was always very comfortable in the airplane even though uh you know it, it could jump up and bite you and there was things that were scary but but it, <laughs> it it always brought me back, and I, I was pretty pretty uh, comfortable in it. What, uh, what what emergencies did you have? Um, I lost loss of an engine. You know, a shell out an engine. I've had. Uh, um, <laughs> I hit a seagull at six hundred knots at two hundred feet at Blue Horse Range. <laughs> that one uh, it took out the right motor uh, after it hit my can. It hit the canopy or not the canopy, the uh, glare shield on the radar and bounced into the right motor. And so it took out the right motor. I mean, just shelled it because we were going so fast. And so I pulled off target and turned and called my number three. I'm like, hey, come on, do a battle damage check. And so when he came up, uh, he's like, hey, you need to get this on the ground. The nose is coming apart. And that's when I kind of you know leaned forward and looked over the, the glare shield and the fiberglass was fraying. And so that uh, that nose cone was was literally disintegrating. Uh, so we did a real quick single engine uh, approach and landing there at, at uh, Lee Warden Air Base there in Holland and uh, landed to clear the runway and uh, got out and, and the nose was just shredded. There was shards hanging and uh, the left motor, which ran the whole time, uh, was full of fiberglass. Um, so I was pretty glad it kept running uh, because one thing I never wanted to do when the 111 was eject, uh, the capsule was a good system, uh, but uh, we had guys get pretty hurt even though it worked. Um, we, we lost three jets while I was at Hayford, um, none in combat, but we had uh, one ejection when we were on our way to Inserlik, there was a crew headed out um, from the uh, 77th, I guess, or the 55th. Anyway, they we were replacing them, uh, and uh, they had some kind of smoke in the cockpit fire issue and ended up doing some stupid stuff and putting the jet out of control and ejecting. Uh, when they landed, they, uh, the pilot was okay, but the whistle broke his back. Um, and so the other two, one was successful, guys were fine. It was the EF right off the end of the runway. And then we had two guys die at Hayford at the approach end, uh, stalled the airplane on short final, ejected, and the can- the capsule hit the ground about the time the chute came out. 
and they both died in the seats. So, so yes, a good system uh, had a lot of good capabilities, but I didn't want to try it. Um, if it's okay, can I can I ask you a bit more about that stalling incident? How, how, how sure. does that come about? I mean, I I know that how you stall an aeroplane, but how? Yeah. What sort of things have to go wrong in the cockpit for that to happen? Yeah, that that was a incident where the pilot had been at squadron officer school, so he had been out of flying for quite a while. He came back and was doing his uh, first back in the airplane uh, to get his landing currency set back up. He was doing emergency patterns and no flap, no slot. Um, what I don't know that they ever determined. Uh, you know, with the wing clean. So in the 111, uh, we had slots and fowler flaps. Um, so no no devices, which is a higher thrust uh, recovery. It was an overhead, so he's coming around the final turn. And uh, got slow, starts to uh, try to go around. Um, my understanding is, I don't know if you've been to Upper Hayford, there's a small village of Lower Hayford right off the end of runway uh, 09 there. And... Uh, we believe that they were trying to stay with the airplane to get it past Lower Hayford before they ejected, which ultimately saved the village and killed them. Uh, so he just got slow and, and started stalling, was trying to get it around. Uh, they probably should have ejected earlier, uh, but saved the village of Lower Hayford. And there's a plaque in Lower Hayford thanking them uh, for saving the village. Uh, of course, they lost their lives. That would be probably then one of the few occasions where that statement would be made about trying to avoid the, the school or the village, yeah. and it would actually be true. Yeah, because uh, that's what you always read, isn't it? So you, yeah. So, um, and and in terms of then of the, um, I mean, because I, I I grew up in Newmarket, and uh, okay. we had a, we had a couple of one elevens crashed, and um, mm -hmm. um, you know the pilots the the pilot was ejected. Um, but there's there's sort of bags on the bottom, aren't they? they and if they don't mm -hmm. deploy, then you you have a very rough landing. And I think one of the ones that went down yeah. in Newmarket, the the guys were very badly injured. The, yeah. the 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 capsule came out in time. The parachutes opened, but the bags didn't deploy. So they yeah. You know, after after the guys died at uh, Hayford, there we got a couple of you know they always try to fix it, right? So so their decision was to put collapsible uh, steel in the seat frame so that it would give them more of a cushion, but that was gonna cost a lot of money. <laughs> so in the interim, they gave us a thicker seat cushion. You know, like, yeah, I don't think that's gonna help, but thanks a lot. <laughs> it, was, it was a little bit, little bit cozier, but yeah, I didn't think I was gonna help much. <laughs> we all kind of scoffed that. Just, just quickly then, and then we'll, we'll wrap up on, on the F11 <laughs> side, but um, <laughs> You've you've mentioned um, obviously the primary purpose of those E models at Upper Hayford was to you know participate in the the single integrated integrated operating plan the mm -hmm. the, the nuclear war plan right. psyop um, uh, but also that there's there's a strong conventional role uh, you ended up not flying low so you don't use some of those strong capabilities of the airplane yeah. now you're flying medium level did, did you come out of that as a community with an accelerated sense then you know having gone to lossy and try to work with the jags to, mm -hmm. to do precision capabilities uh, that that the f-111e's days were over did it still have yeah. uh, a future yeah the at, i think at that point uh the decisions were starting to be made already that the strike eagle was going to replace the 111 um, and so we knew pretty much our days were numbered, not not right after Desert Storm, but not long after. Uh, they started talking about the base closing down um, in the beginning of 92. Uh, so, um, you know, obviously the war was in 91. So we had about a year of heyday time, you know, where we were awesome and, and still and still relevant. Uh, but then uh, but then, yeah, it looked like the strike eagle was going to come in and they were going to start uh, de uh, deactivating the 111s. Um, so, so yeah, most of the guys are starting to kind of go like, well, what's next and where are we going? Cause, uh, shortly after that was kind of looking like it was going to happen. They announced that upper Hayford would close with the 111 leaving. Uh, and then of course, uh, Lake and Heath was going to transition to the strike. So, so we were, you know, kind of redheaded stepchildren at that point where, uh, you better find something to do or, or you're going to get, you know, you'd be the last guy there and who knows where you're going to go. Um, so so that was about the time where where I had started looking like what's my future going to be and and uh, because Lake and Heath was transitioning, there really wasn't excess capacity for other TX courses to the Strike Eagle. 
um, the, the transition pipeline was pretty full. And then by now they have uh, new guys coming out of pilot training that are getting the system as well. So, so the training pipeline for the strike at that point was, was packed. Um, I didn't really want to go to the Viper. And so uh, it looked like there was a couple of different opportunities and one of them was uh, to go to AT 38s. And so um, that's what I thought would be a great way to basically hang out while the pipeline, uh, the bulge in the pipeline cleared. And then I assumed uh, with my experience after an AT 38 tour, I'd be able to get into the strike Eagle uh, with a kind of more of a choice of where to go. Um, so that was my calculus. I thought, Hey, I'll ask my boss if I can go to, uh, to the AT and see if he can help me out. Um, so our squadron commander at the time, uh, Mark Hyatt, great guy, you know, I kind of went and sat down with him and said, you know, Hey, I know I have, uh, another year and a half to go, but you know, we're closing. I really don't want to be here at the end. Uh, is there any way I could get released a little bit early and go do something else? And, and he, uh, he said, yeah, um, I'd kind of done everything I could do as a junior guy. I was a four ship flight lead. I was uh, in weapons. I, there was a couple of potential opportunities to go to the weapons school before the 111 died. But I'm like, what good is it to come out of the weapons school with a 111 patch on your shoulder? Uh, it's not all that applicable. And there was some guys that took that on that, to be quite honest, I, I was like, dude, you're not a strike eagle weapons guy. You know, you, mm -hmm. you need go relearn it uh so so i didn't want to be that guy um so i didn't pursue that and i i ended up getting the the at38 job and thought uh that'll help me out i will learn air to air again or better uh and then maybe i'll be a viable candidate to go to the strike eagle after um and so that's what i asked for and ended up getting that uh that job and so i uh I left about six months early of my three years at Hayford. We left in uh, December of 92 uh, to go back to Holloman and be an instructor in the AT. Well, well, we'll pick up on the story next time around then. But before before I, before I let you go for this one, um, you said something very controversial. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there won't be any F-16 pilots watching this, but if there are, uh, I, yeah. I heard you say you didn't want to fly the Viper. Why, why not? Yeah. Um, I think, and, and uh, to be honest, uh, I felt like that uh, it was kind of the jack of all trades, master of none. Um, for the strike role, we were strikers. They came when they could, and they did a good job. But, but like I said, they, you know, you're down to your last engine uh, and out of gas when you take off, especially with a load of bombs. Uh, and so, I, I wasn't a big fan of single engine fighters, um, and uh, and uh, I've, I wanted to kind of be better at, uh, at the mission. So, so that was one of the things I was not necessarily super psyched about the strike, because really it's the same thing, um, but it's two engine, it's two seat. Uh, so it has those uh, capabilities that the 111 had in the strike role that I kind of thought were lim limitations for the, for the F-16. Uh, I'm never, a, you know, due to bashes, the, the Viper boys, but, uh, but uh, it was just something that, you know, hey, if I was picking, <laughs> I would uh, I would go a different direction. Um, if if they said, you know, hey, Marco, you're going to the Viper, I'd go Roger that. When do I? Where do I go? And and how fast do you want me to be there? Uh, I would I would have gone, uh, but it it wasn't the path that I was looking for. And I suppose, in fairness, for for an eagle guy, you did well because you did call it Viper and not Fighting Falcon. So, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, I try. <laughs> Well, you know, at Mountain Home, when we had those guys there, we kind of had to be nice to them. They were in the wing. 